Hi, welcome. My name is Rachel Kaplan, and I'm currently serving as the interim director at CAB. Thank you for joining us for today's program. The Chicago Architecture Biennial is a nonprofit organization based in Chicago and dedicated to creating an international forum on architecture and urbanism. This year, our programs are related to the upcoming Biennial's edition theme, The Available City, which is led by artistic director, David Brown. The Available City brings together local and international design thinkers with community stakeholders, residents, and students to chart new uses for design and architecture that respond to the existing fabric of the city. This afternoon's program is part of CAB's new model of free year-round programming. This model allows our organization to share the thinking that goes into creating the biennial and to engage with critical issues facing the field of architecture and beyond on an ongoing basis. Today's program, Wandering in Chicago, um, Akambode Akambi in Conversation, will look at Akambode's unique method of quietly wandering, looking, listening, and photographing. Kristen Taylor, Curator of Academic Programs and Collections at the Museum of Contemporary Phot Photography, We'll speak with Akambodi about his work documenting cities across the globe and his time spent in Chicago and in North Lawndale in 2019. In the summer of 2019, Akambodi visited Chicago for a month-long residency co-hosted by CAB and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in Homan Square, located in Chicago's North Lawndale. During his time in Chicago, Akambodi led public photography workshops and engaged with the North Lawndale residents. His time in Chicago produced two sets of photographs collectively titled Easy Like Sunday Morning, North Lawndale. This work was exhibited at the 2019 Biennial and other such stories and at the SAC, SAIC Home and Square site. One sought to capture the essence of the North Lawndale neighborhood while the other looked at the larger city. After the close of the 2019 Chicago Architecture Biennial, the collection of 40 prints making up Easy Like Sunday Morning, North Lawndale were acquired by the Museum of Contemporary Photography as a part of their permanent collection. In line with the theme of the 2021 biennial, The Available City, Akambodi's work responds to and reflects how visitors and residents alike navigate social structures and spaces in a city. I'm honored to introduce to you today, Kristen Taylor, the Curator of Academic Programs and Collections at the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College, who will be um, leading the conversation with Akambode. And of course, Akambode, whose work initially rooted in the fields of architecture and journalism, focus on, focuses on sprawling megacities, especially those on the African continent. Akambode wanders the highways and byways of cities across the world, um, searching for moments of pure serendipity. Today, Akambode continues to document major cities as well as smaller locales. Before turning it over, please note that throughout the program, we invite you to use the Q&A function to submit questions. Stay tuned for more information about CAB's next program with the Danish Arts Foundation in March. More information will be on our website soon. And with that, I turn it over to Kristen and Akambodi. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you for having me. And thank you, Akambodi, for being here. We had the great experience of meeting with you virtually earlier um, in the pandemic last year where you spoke to our audience in the Museum of Contemporary Photography about your practice at large, which was really wonderful and I encourage all of you to see that recording of that lecture if you were not there. Um, but today I hope we can just talk about your residency here in Chicago and what your experiences were photographing while here for a month. Um, you said that this was your first time in Chicago so um, let me start by putting some images up before I start talking. Um, okay, I'll share my screen. All right, so this is the um, installation of the exhibition at the Architecture Biennial in 2019. And for anyone who did not see this in person, um, the Architecture Biennial is always hosted in the Chicago Cultural Center, which used to be a library. So it's not really your conventional space. As you can see, the ceilings are very tall. There's kind of unexpected nooks everywhere, beautiful light. It's a very fun place to wander around and see and experience all the different types of work they have on display. Um, so this is an installation of two grids of 16 that you had of this project. And then you'll notice here, there's a little text panel. So I wanted to start with talking about this text that you chose to display with your work. Um, I have it up here for people to be able to look over it. Um, there's two pieces. So the first is this poem by Wanda Coleman called Sidewalk. Yeah. 
Uh, what do you want me to say about it? <laughs> Sorry. And then the other is by Jane Jacobs. So what I wanted you to hopefully talk about is why you chose these two pieces um, to introduce your work with the images. Um, <laughs> going back in time a bit, um, I'm a great um, uh, fan of Wanda Coleman's poetry. Huh? I discovered it in the 90s and I really like her work. And uh, she um, lives in California, I believe in San Francisco, LA. And um, I really felt that she, she, she was singing, saying something very much about urban life in the States. Huh? So when I was doing these in, um, doing this work in, in Chicago, I often thought of her when I put the images together in the grids. I, I thought one of, maybe I could take part of one of her poems. And then Jane, um, Jacob, she um, is a very insightful writer on urban cities in the States. And I feel she really got it here in this very short um, quote I, I took from one of her uh, writings. So this is a bigger question that I wanna ask you about text and image. And I, I think we can start with in talking about just even the title of the, pro the project, which you called Easy Like Sunday Morning. And this is the image that I'm sure inspired that title. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that title for this project and also the ways that you think about text as a component to your photographs? Wow. <laughs> um, I've actually, ever since my childhood, I've had a, a kind of very strong love, actually, relationship to the United States. And of course, their music and especially um, soul music, um, black music, all kinds of music, country and western, all kinds of music. And so it's always there for me, right deep inside myself and also in the background. So in wandering around um, North London in the west side of Chicago, I kept on thinking about how could I title the work? I don't often like titling the work in uh, I'm mentioning the geographical space, but something much more poetic or much, in this case, a, a, a quote from a song. And when I saw this particular um, graffiti, it just came to me then. And also um, because uh, the West Side, North Londale, is a bit, um, uh, how can I put it? It's, it's a blighted space in many respects, uh, many um, um, empty lots and um, a sense of, of not dereliction, just going too far, but it, it kind of, um, it's not like downtown Chicago, for example, or other parts which are much more gentrified and much more built in. Huh? So then it had something of, of, of Sunday. So that's why I felt then I really had to say something about this Sunday feeling. So it came in this particular um, title for the song. So yeah, I guess we should, I thought my first question for you would have been about your impressions of Chicago since you've been photographing all over the world and you have a very unique and specific way of photographing where you don't call yourself a street photographer but instead a wanderer. So thinking about really slowing down and experiencing a place as you walk through it and listen and I think experience a place through all of your senses. So we already touched upon music and this idea of sound. Um, can you talk about how Chicago, if it was different in any way from other places you usually photograph? And if so, how? Um, I always like to say each city has its own personality. And the personality of the city is very much, I was thinking about this today, it's, it's independent of the human beings living in the city. I mean, they have some influence as well, of course, but it has to do much more with its location, the geography, the climate, and then also the way the city has come into being over the um, decades, centuries. Chicago is this very specific place. I, I didn't know before going there, but Chicago is actually a um, First Nation word, which means actually wild um, garlic um, fields. And, um, very special about Chicago, especially when I first came into, into the city. And then I started wondering almost immediately and then trying to understand, listen in into the city. 
many of the images you're showing here are from actually from North Lawndale. And um, the, the very first image, uh, the one that you showed with the, um, the uh, pillar, mm -hmm. that's for me, because that was um, Holman Square and where, um, yeah, the one before this one, yeah. And you see the um, pillar and then the it's a, um, a lady sitting there or waiting for the bus to come. She's as a bus stop just in front of this building. And this building was the first, or what the first, the original Sears building. Huh? So Sears established itself in North Londale about, in the, I think in the thirties, no, no, even before then in the twenties. Huh? It's like the precursor of Amazon today. Huh? And um, this particular image for me was very, very um, insightful in that it's just a moment, I'm, I'm standing behind the lady. I, I wasn't waiting for the bus, I was waiting for the rain to stop more or less. And, and then it's a kind of coming together and also the, the very strong grounding of the pillar on a kind of fundament. And then the pillars go up. And so this kind of um, architecture of um, referencing Greek architecture actually was for me very, very interesting. And then of course, this is a kind of, um, not, not quite a crossroads here, but you, you see the car in the distance. So the, a, a side road coming onto the main road. And Chicago has an amazing um, grid-like structure with cities from the, from the inner city going out to the different um, suburbs. Fascinating city for me. So the, yeah, that's um, more or less what I was trying to, yeah, to circumscribe, to understand get into in, in depth. And you also, as part of your project, worked with people in the neighborhood. So you were leading workshops, um, I think also photographing with students. And um, I don't know if this is a unique experience or not, perhaps you can answer that, but is that common in your work to be involved with the community or are you usually photographing on your own? And if it is, a new experience for you, how did that maybe shape the way that you were photographing yourself? Um, I, I actually love working with the community and I, I, I often do workshops with the community, with students, with school children, and also with adults huh, all over the world. And I really, really do enjoy this. Huh. I, although, I also though, much prefer working by myself. Huh, so wandering alone, because when you wander in a group, there's too many distractions at times. People talking to you, asking you questions, uh, just you know, just moving together. But this also can be very, very useful and helpful. And I did learn a lot from the, those I was working with in um, North Londale. So they also told me a lot about their community, of course. I listened in and um, they gave me some insights. Uh, also, also places to go and also, um, uh, yeah, how to move within this particular space. And then um, at the same time, there's this sort of um, narrative that um, parts of Chicago can be quite dangerous, gun violence, criminality, and so on. But people are living there. And you are often, um, when you go there, you, you don't feel so much this, this um, latent danger. It is there at times, unfortunately, but you just move. You, you live every day, eh? you go shopping. I, I go on my wandering. I try to take, make photographs and engage with the people. And then that's also very useful because I, I, I did these workshops and we, uh, from time to time we wandered out within um, North Londale. And it's very interesting watching them, how they also negotiated the city. From that, I learned from them and hopefully they learned from me as well. Some very, very interesting conversations actually. Mm -hmm. I love this image with your, um, well, you have text again and a lot of text will appear throughout the work in the form of graffiti or signs or um, advertisements even. Um, but this with the, the vertical lines of the peace balloons and then the vertical lines of this kind of, um, I want to call it a monument, but I think it's probably actually more of like an industrial building sculpture. But the way that you compose the image is so um, so interesting to me. And I feel like when we, the more and more time that I spend with your images, the more I see these kinds of connections that you're making visually between all of the elements in the photograph. Um, can you talk a little bit about composing images in your camera and how you sort of think about framing the story that you're trying to tell? I always tell um, what, 
um, um, younger colleagues that it's so important to really look. And um, with, first of all, without the camera. And then you look through the viewfinder and you try very, very much to see all the different elements, the foreground, the middle ground, the background. This particular image is in downtown Chicago. And in the background, for me, very, very important is the Indian on the horse. Huh? Uh, it's a bit of a, for me, problematic um, sculpture because the Indian is riding the horse uh, bareback and he, the, the Indian himself is almost, um, almost naked. When I say Indian, I meant I mentioned actually First Nation people. Huh? But then people coming into the image or in the middle space, but also then this whole problematic of hunger, skipping meals and all this kind of stuff. So I'm all constantly um, looking out, trying to understand. And when I bring up the camera, trying to compose as, as finely as possible, as carefully as possible, it's again a kind of song, a kind of um, engagement with my surroundings. Um, I was thinking about this again today as well, because the camera is actually very much an instrument, like just like a, a music instrument. Huh? So you play with the instrument to, to make sounds, or in, in, in our case, as, as um, photographers, to, to make images, to bring out images. This particular image also in downtown Chicago. And here I was very, very much interested because of the railway lines. And um, they had so many um, railways going into the inner city, but this particular place, um, case of crossing over canals or the river. And this one particular, you can see some part of um, a kind of drawbridge which has been pulled up. And then just, I'm just sort of more or less hanging in there and waiting for something to happen. And this happens to be this passerby, a lady looking into her mobile phone. Another very interesting thing, um, um, Christine, is how, um, I don't try to sort of be a fly on the wall or blend in, but um, over the years, I've learned how to be such that very few people actually notice that I'm actually photographing, unless of course they're really looking. So then it's, it's very much trying to take in the city, try to um, listen to its vibe, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the way that you have them had them installed at the biennial is, is so interesting too, because you have an image like this. And then I tried to communicate this in the PowerPoint best I could. Then you also have images like this. So thinking about the quote you had in the beginning about segregation and discrimination and thinking about sort of the, the heartbreak of a city and the struggles of um, cities not sort of fairly treating all residents or all residents not having the same access to resources. So with having the image of the person just zoned into their cell phone and then another here of someone um, asking for change, it, it, I think really kind of you're weaving a story throughout these images that the other ones of like parking lots or um, more like banal everyday moments become a lot heavier once you have these types of images too. Um, could you talk about the sort of maybe like bigger messages that I think your work is conveying about um, either like political stories, like you've made work about apartheid, for example, in South Africa, or making work in, in about segregation in Chicago as, as being one of, the, one of the plot lines of your work. Um, how do you sort of negotiate that and not being very heavy handed? I feel like your work isn't like shouting a loud message about the sort of political undertones, but it's sort of subtly woven through. Um, can you talk about that, if that is correct? Yeah. <laughs> This particular image was very near where I was staying. I was staying in an apartment in downtown Chicago. And um, over the time, over the days and weeks, I more or less knew, um, um, yeah, some of the homeless people around. Here, this particular man, he's one of the homeless people and he used to beg from time to time, passers by. Uh, it was raining quite heavily at this particular moment. And um, I was just standing under um, the scaffolding, actually, just waiting for the rain to stop a bit. Huh? And um, this particular image reminded me of another image I took years and years ago, again, in a rainstorm in Benin um, Republic in West Africa. But this time, not of, it was of children playing in the rain. He wasn't playing in the rain, but he was somehow trying to negotiate his own particular space. Huh? Homelessness, um, 
discrimination, um, the different um, realms of, of um, poverty and um, wealth, really, really, I find sometimes very, very challenging and very, very disturbing. But like you said, Christine, and I'm very grateful for what you just said, um, I try not to do it or show it heavy, heavy handedly, but rather try to go ever deeper into it. What does it mean, actually, for example, to be homeless in, in, a, in a city like Chicago? Huh? I was there in the summer. It's more or less than you want, one can, you know, live if you want to, <laughs> but, you know, relatively um, um, you know, comfortably, you know, on the streets possibly as well. It's not very comfortable, but they manage. Huh? But in winter, super, super cold. Mm -hmm. There was um, near me, near my apartment, actually on, this, on the same block, huh? there was um, another homeless person whom I really personally got to know. Huh? And I think this is so important because then it becomes, it becomes very personal. Huh? Daniel was his name. I, he might still be around, I wonder. And um, he came from Milwaukee, had been a homeless for about two years, a young man, but he was very particular about cleanliness. Huh? So all his um, um, sleeping, his bedding, his mattress, very, very clean. Every morning he would tidy everything up and clean around everywhere around the street. And he was next to a Starbucks. Huh? And then I noticed one time he was actually cleaning inside the Starbucks. So I asked him, um, how was he negotiating that? Huh? And he did that for free, but was given um, some food and some coffee. Huh? So um, like all of us, we, we have to try to live within the city or you know, the countryside, wherever it is, and we find our way forward. And this is very much what I'm trying to um, photograph actually. So in this case, it's not just this um, other person here in the foreground, but the people in the middle ground, but also the high rise buildings in the background. You can't actually see the rain, you can have a bit of a sense of it. It's very much again, trying to, um, literally trying to listen to the vibrations of Chicago. I love that you called it that. Um, and I've heard you talk about listening to the vibrations of a city and other interviews that you've done. And, and again, thinking about all of the senses and the different kinds of um, ways that you could experience a place as you're photographing, that you're not just going with a particular shot in mind, but, but slowing down enough to feel those vibrations and feel that energy of a place. And I think that's what comes through in, in looking at your work too, is that when the longer you spend with it, the more you feel the vibrations of your work and your space and kind of how you reacted to the space. Um, this is another image that reminds me or, or makes me think of um, a deeper political message or I guess a, a social message without being too heavy. Um, talks a lot about, I think, um, class uh, differences or, or kind of um, a, a wide gap in sort of the different experiences that people have with having these two kind of workers inside this glass pristine building and then the person tending to the garden on their phone. Um, and then we're kind of back um, in Lawndale where you have a lot of images again of the signs um, and fences and barricades. Um, what role does architecture and sort of the built environment play in your work, if any, um, since this is the architecture biennial that we're speaking to the audience right now? Uh, architecture is for me very important. It's, it's um, an expression of the architects, of course, and of, but of us, of um, how we want to live, how we, and the buildings we live in, or in that particular the, um, image before, um, that was an office building, um, how we um, negotiate these kind of spaces. Huh? This particular image, it fascinated me. I was there for some time just trying to sense something here. And then um, there were people inside the building behind the, um, the, uh, the glass using their lifts or coming down or going up. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, <laughs> as the case is, May, may be of a different skin color to the man outside who was you're so quite right tending the gardener. At the same time, the ubiquity, the ubiqu ubiquity of, of the mobile phone. It's all over this, all everywhere nowadays. And um, he's taking a, a, a rest, a pause, and you know, I don't know what he was doing on his mobile phone. And then also the vegetation as well, for me, very important too. And it's, it's a bit off kilter because, I mean, 
we, we, do, we do think or we do like to feel that um, everything is correct and straight and right, but cities aren't completely like that. And there's always something not quite, not quite uh, in balance. It's not something not quite right. So this is something, again, I'm trying to all the time see or to, this particular image you take. And the next image, the one after this, um, which you just you showed, yeah, this was of, um, uh, what do you call it them again? Um, an empty lot, which had become quite um, contested space for drug dealing. Huh? So the neighborhood got together, it's in part of North Londale called K-Town, and started growing um, plants and um, vegetables and flowers. And there was this uh, Pacific day, was, there was a kind of opening of the space. So, so you can see a bit of the unity um, idea. And um, the uh, spades in the, in the middle ground were actually um, uh, reconvened weapons. Huh? So weapons which had been handed in, melted down and then made into spades. Huh? Yeah. And um, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist came to um, um, honor this particular opening. It was a very moving moment with quite a lot of um, um, uh, uh, um, people from the neighborhood came to, to, to be there. And it was, I found it a very interesting moment to be there. But again, um, <laughs> you mentioned something about heavy handedness. This image for me some, has a bit of heavy handedness because of the fencing. Huh? There's so much fencing in Chicago and sort of um, blocking out, blocking in. Huh? It's, it's, a, it's a kind of, I don't know how to put it. It's a kind of way of trying to, yeah, reconfigure space. And so yeah, that was part of my um, take or make on, on, on this particular day. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the take and make distinction? Because you, you talk about this a lot um, when other people ask you questions about your work too, about how that's very important for you, the difference between saying you take a photograph or you make a photograph. It seems like you still automatically want to say take and you always correct yourself to say make. <laughs> to, to, to make, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Taking uh, um, is very much um, part of this give and take. In order to take, you really have to give. And in, in photography, in my, my type of photography, I really have to give in the sense of listening in, looking and giving of myself before I can begin to take or then going further to make the image. This particular image in, four, in the foreground is actually Yo-Yo Ma with his cello. And in the middle ground is the um, convener of this particular opening of the space that day, I forget his name, unfortunately, but he's from K-Town, very, very engaged. It was very nice to, uh, meeting him and talking with him as well. And you see a bit of the crowd in, in the distance. And now I was kept on moving around, how can I, <laughs> make, take an image of this particular moment, which is not, again, as you, I like, I like what you say, not heavy handed or and another expression I, I like to be, not so much in your face, but shows much more the subtleness of the whole, of the moment. And um, I'm not sure whether I got it fully here, but I think there was something, I must say something of this particular day, when Yo-Yo Ma started playing, it was such a wonderful, silent moment. And the cello then really speaks out almost like a human voice, but very, very strong chords. Huh? And this is in Cape Town, one of the so-called notorious <laughs> areas of North London with gun violence and criminality, but now everything totally different. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful moment. Huh? And it's actually it's an honor and a grace to be with such people, not just Yo-Yo Ma, but also the, the um, the man in the middle space, the convener of the moment, and also the other people, all the community there as well. It's really, and it's for such moments actually, um, I wonder. So I wonder in the hope of coming into such moments. Huh? And then it's like the weaving of threads, they come together, hopefully I'm prepared then to take, make the images. <laughs> And do you um, think about a lot with, whenever I think about the difference between taking and making, um, you talked about the giving role of the photographer, but do you also think about the, I, and I think you do, the violence or sort of the potential for um, 
doing damage and making photographs in places or telling stories that could then um, perpetuate sort of a, a negative image of that place, especially when it's a neighborhood that, like you said, deals with um, heavier crime or there's sort of a perception already. And I know in Chicago, we have a big problem with people staying in their own neighborhoods because they have a perception of what other neighborhoods are like and that they're unsafe. Um, is that part of your thoughts about taking and making or am I just putting that on there? No, it, it is part of my thoughts and I'm, I'm very aware of these things. And I, <laughs> stereotype, it's, 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 I think we all have it in us. Huh? I try very much to avoid that, but sometimes I find it creeping in again. Huh? He, this particular image is perhaps a case in point, because again, we have a derelict um, plot of land, nothing much happening there. Then you see some signage, some billboards, and this, and, and um, in the middle ground is actually a, a liquor store, but also a kind of um, kiosk where you can buy some, some small foodstuffs and so snacks and so, so on. And oftentimes around these places, you see people standing outside drinking, you know, already um, the liquor they've bought inside. Um, I engage with these spaces. I engage with the stereotypes, but I try not, try not to, to take, make stereotypical images. Um, it, is, it is a problem in photography or actually it's a problem of life. How much can I avoid um, the cliches? How much can I avoid? How much can I not be, um, yeah, uh, so look down on a particular situation or look down on a particular person? So again, I try to carry myself, I try to give off myself in the taking and in the making, but also in my wandering as well. So I often talk with a friend of mine that. We really, both of us, we really try not to be um, judgmental. So, but it, it's always there. It's always there in the background. It's so crazy. Huh? It's part of our socialization. Huh? Mm -hmm. But I still try to avoid it. Huh? So, and then this is very, um, for me, very, very important. Huh? Mm -hmm. Could you talk about your editing process? Like, do you make a lot of images and then edit them down to this small selection, or do you photograph more slowly? Um, and not use a lot of film? How do you typically work? Um, I photograph quite a lot, <laughs> um, but it's medium format. So there are only 12 um, images per film, in my case. And then um, over a two, three, four week period, maybe I have 60, 80 rolls of film, take them back home, develop them myself, um, look at the contact sheets and then gradually edit down. Uh, uh, on a good day, sometimes on one, on one roll of film with the 12 images, I might have two or three good images. On other days, I might um, um, take, make five rolls of film, no good image. Yeah? Mm -hmm. what, again, this is, again, this is part of this judgmental thing or being stereotypical. What is actually good? What is bad? Eh? This particular image is of a building which used to be, I believe, if I get it, if I remember rightly, a kind of, not, not a, um, a, um, a leisure center in, in North Londale. It was, um, I forget exactly, but it was, it wasn't a, a, um, some kind of um, community center, but bigger, you can see, uh, but it's now more or less boarded up, not, not in use at, the mo at, at that particular time in 2019. So now I was trying to position myself. I wandered around, <laughs> wandered back and forth. This is a major um, highway I'm going through North Londale there in, in the middle ground. But I, I deliberately inclu included the um, traffic lights and also the, um, the bit of the, um, of the road as well, which is not quite um, uh, pristine. And um, yeah, it, it worked for me. So then eventually in the editing, I look for images which literally sing. And again, this, the, especially this singing like on, on a Sunday. Huh? So there, there were people moving around as well, but not so many. So you see the, hardly anybody, this could be on a Sunday um, morning. Huh? This, this was actually during the week. Huh? So you are self-taught in photography, right? Like you said, told me earlier that you studied literature and taught yourself how to photograph, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So how did you arrive at photographing and why do you think um, the camera is your best um, medium, I guess, with, with it seems that sound and, and language is also such a big player. Why do you choose to photograph? 
So um, originally, um, I wanted to become a writer. So I felt that the best way to become a writer was to study um, English, uh, uh, and, um, yeah, English literature, and then go into the academic field and become a writer. And then um, when I moved to Germany to, to do a, uh, a doctorate, uh, another close friend of mine sort of, um, sort of <laughs> encouraged me to, be, to go more into photography. So, so much so that eventually I got a so-called good um, a single lens reflex, a 35 millimeter camera. And I realized with images, you can still tell, tell, a, tell a story. So that's why I just started off and it became big. It became a big of, of obsession. And then um, like in this particular image over the years, of course, the more you, the more you read, the more you think you know, the less you know. So the more you um, begin to photograph, the more you see, the more you realize you haven't seen enough. You hardly have, you've hardly ever, ever seen anything. This particular image was made on the south side of Chicago. Again, during a, a kind of festival moment. Huh? The, um, I think it was a, a Juneteenth um, festival in one of the, um, one of the, uh, sites of the Chicago Biennial, actually. I forget the particular site now. But these two women, pardon me? Was it at the Sweetwater Foundation? Yes, thank you very much. Sweetwater Foundation, wonderful place. And these two women were, were preparing to do a ritual, which they had got from the um, African um, rituals of, of dancing and um, like using the uh, brooms to clean a particular space, space, but also as a kind of ritual of um, objects. Huh? And they were just um, preparing for their, um, their performance and I happened to catch, um, to, to catch this particular moment. Huh? And for me, it was so interesting because this could have been in West Africa. And they're also in white as well, very, very interesting, but especially the brooms in their hands. Huh? And what was very interesting for me was that they and some others had actually been to West Africa. So, so beautiful, this particular moment. So, yeah, and um, there you can see also in the background, again, the, um, so sometimes these derelict plots or, or you know, this, this is Sweetwater Foundation, but uh, some other parts of South Side were really, really sort of completely derelict, you know, open spaces, um, buildings which, which were no longer there. And sometimes quite challenging to wander around, huh? but I, I, did, I did it as well. I, in fact, I, I wandered in many different parts of Chicago. I never really felt threatened, but I did feel sometimes some kind of tension in the air. Yeah. And is this image, this one I've, I've looked at a lot and I'm trying to figure out where you are um, it seems like you're making, again, a comment about sort of the distinctions of, of neighborhoods and places and that this is maybe more more affluent neighborhood with the like American flag draping on the fence. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this image and where you made it? Actually, um, this, I uh, forget the neighborhood's name now, but I was looking for, um, when, when I got to Chicago, I, um, I wanted to buy film. And um, I ordered online from B and H in New York, but they didn't have the film I wanted. So I started. I was panicking a bit. So I was checking out different um, uh, photo shops, uh, yeah, camera shops in Chicago. And in this particular case, I was somewhere. Oh man, I forget the neighborhood exactly, but not on the south side. Huh? Um, and I was looking for a particular um, camera shop. And just wondering as well, going on my wanderings as well. And what particularly um, interested me in this image is, you're very right, is the chiascoscuro of the shadow, shadows, the cars, and also the tree, of course. And so particular moments, again, coming together in a particular serendipitous moment. And, um, interestingly for me, eventually I did find my film in downtown Chicago in a um, camera shop called Central, Central Camera which unfortunately, and so sad for me, because I really got to know the shop very well, like the people there very much, was burnt down in the, um, the rioting um, last year um, with the Black Lives Matter um, um, disturbances, or how can I put them, um, up, upheavals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah, so this is part of my um, 
experiences actually in Chicago and also trying to all the time take in, understand the city. Mm -hmm. I'm about to get to questions from other people, but I see someone just asked a question that I was thinking about myself. Um, Cynthia Davidson just asked um, about why you always are photographing in black and white. I don't think I've ever seen you photograph in color, but maybe I just am missing that. Do you ever work in color? And if not, what are your thoughts about black and white and, and that choice? So my, my um, glib answer is always, I say black and white is are also colors, huh? <laughs> but I do work in color, um, but I prefer working in black and white. I, I find it much more suited to what I'm trying to um, get at, what I'm trying to say. Huh? It, as, as in, in this particular image, this, uh, this particular guy <laughs> jumping so high to dunk the basketball through the hoop. This was also at Sweetwater Foundation, huh? part of their um, things they were, um, doing there at the time. And um, yeah, for me, uh, black and white is, is it, it's a very sort of monochrome graphic, but you, could, you can also work in color. I mean, it's, 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 it's my own personal um, de um, decision, my personal, um, what I prefer, but it's, it's open, it's open. Also, I, by the way, I also, something else people often ask, I work with analog equipment, but you can use digital as well. This, Nowadays, the difference is so, so little. It's very hard to see, especially when it's printed or in, in this case, it's exhibited, you can hardly tell the difference. It definitely adds to the beauty of the work though, seeing these prints in person and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you very much. Of course. Um, so I think I should ask some questions. So we have quite a few people asking. I wanna make sure we have time to get to them. Um, Dylan Steele is asking if you listen to music when you are wandering and composing shots. Um, no, I don't wear earphones or listen to music. I do like it when I do come across, um, um, how do you call them now, mega blasters, um, sound boxes, uh, people who move around with their own music or from the cars as well. I do like that. I'm very fond of reggae hip hop, all kinds of music, actually. I really love where I'm listening to music. Huh? So that's one thing I really miss often wandering cities in the Western um, hemisphere, because in West Africa, many places, especially on um, commercial areas, there's a lot of music out on the streets. Huh? But unfortunately, in the Western hemisphere, it's more or less you have sound and sound pollution and so on, so they don't do this so much. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw in another interview, you talk about that cacophony of images too, and sort of looking for the peace and quiet and working. Um, so do you have any advice for people who are trying to wander like you and how to kind of shut out all of that noise and the noise pollution, but also the visual pollution to make work that is so contemplative and meditative like yours? Something you mentioned at the very beginning, um, Christine as well, is slow down. Mm -hmm. Um, relax and then each each and, and every one of us does this in a different way huh? um, I try to breathe as calmly as possible I just take my time huh? and sometimes um, one kilometer um, of wandering can take me two three hours huh? because with each step literally I see something anew huh? and so another thing I do of, of late as well I turn 360 degrees huh? because sometimes it's things behind you which you've actually missed you haven't seen huh? so you, if you look back then you begin to see them it's fascinating so i love doing this so slow down but of course at times as well i do go out in, with a particular um, um goal in mind huh? so it's it's a, always a give and take i always it's like it's like a kind of dance i literally try to dance with the city huh? and i love doing this actually <laughs> That leads nicely into another two questions. I think we can combine one's from Adrian Matson, asking, do you have a favorite city or type of city to wander and photograph? And then Maria Magdalena Campos Pons said, what cities will you photograph next and why? Um, I like returning to cities I've already photographed. I would so much love, I wanted to return to Chicago last year but because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to. This year, possibly next year, hopefully. One city I really love to photograph and wander in is Sao Paulo. An amazing city, so dynamic, so, so amazing. It just, it just blew my mind totally. It is also a very challenging city. The um, 
the, uh, uh, these um, difference between poor people and, and rich people is just, this is horrible, it's, it's not good. And the homelessness in Sao Paulo was, I mean, literally terrifying, it was so, so bad. It was, I couldn't, I, I literally couldn't take it. Huh? But the city fascinated me. And especially the, um, there's a willingness of many inhabitants of Sao Paulo to, to party. So at the weekends, yeah, that was amazing, so it was very crazy. Huh? So that's really fascinating. But there are other cities as well. Um, the African continent, Lagos, is a, also a very dynamic city. Cairo, again. And then um, smaller cities. I was recently in um, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, another amazing smaller city. Very, very sort of flat, not, not very few high rises, but an amazing city. Actually, everywhere I've been to, <laughs> I find so fascinating and amazing. And so to say one particular city really gets to me, no, I, all of them. But if I had to just, to just to choose one at this particular moment in time, I would choose Sao Paulo. Okay. Um, we got a question, we're getting a lot of questions and now hopefully I have time for all of them. Abraham Okobasi, I hope they said that right. Says, hi, Uncle Bodhi. Um, and I hear that this is a nickname that you have, my friend. Please, please. <laughs> or that you're also called Uncle B. <laughs> AB, you better stop it all. <laughs> uh -huh. um, he says, thanks for this conversation. How do you navigate your own fears, if any, when you're in spaces or places known for violent crimes, et cetera, Rio or Lagos or Chicago Southside, for example? Um, AB, nice to hear you. Huh? Um, the, it's most important, don't be afraid. I mean, don't be careless, don't be, um, 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 you know, um, ignore the dangers, huh? but don't be afraid. Huh? I go through as calmly and as quietly as possible. Huh? Another thing also is very often I actually engage with and look at the so-called um, criminals, so far as I can recognize them, see them. And it's very interesting because then they look away. They, they almost feel as if they've been, yeah, um, you know, <laughs> that you've seen, you've seen them, you've seen through them. Huh? But again, you, one has to be very careful, especially in cases where um, um, people are armed or, or have a, of, of, of a very violent nature. Yeah, it's, and sometimes, of course, I, I just go away because it's just too dangerous or it's, it's, too, it's too challenging. But especially as I get older, you, you learn more and more how to deal with these things, how to deal with the spaces. And very often, not always, but very often, um, the so-called um, violent ones, those with criminal intent, seem to um, discard or just ignore older people. This is a very particular image. This was actually the beginning of my, um, of my series of grids, uh, because it's like almost like um, Alice in Wonderland, and you push the button, to go into another space. Huh? Mm -hmm. This is also in um in um on the west side in um North Lawndale. And this was part of the um Sears um complex. Huh? So this is part of their um power station, which is now more or less not in use anymore. But I love this thing of the push button huh? mm -hmm. because I couldn't I wasn't quite sure what it meant. Huh? Do I have to actually push the button? And do I get into another kind of space? And also I'm referencing what I mentioned earlier, the fencing all the time. Right. It's so unwelcoming, but it's inviting you to <laughs> engage yeah. with this pleasure to support it up. Mm -hmm. um, here we have a good question from Levi Shan. It says, when you are out wandering, do you have a pre-planned route or do you allow yourself to be taken in a direction? When you are dancing with the city, who leads? The city leads. The city leads. I try not to have a pre-plan. Sometimes I do go to a particular space because, or for example, um, when um, the, that opening of with Yo-Yo Ma, I knew that was happening, so I actually went there then, of course. But I, I give myself enough time just in case I see something on the way to get, get out of the subway of, of the, the transport system to take make photographs again. Um, I try to be as open and as finely attuned as possible. Finally attuned means literally wandering as slowly as possible, taking my time, so to speak. Huh? Um, this is another image you see in the, in the distance, again, part of the um, chimneys of the um, industrial complex, which, is part, which used to be part of um, North Lawndale. Huh? But for me, very, very disturbing is this, you know, the, um, 
uh, signage, the um, writing on the um, lamppost, cease fire. It's just, it's, it's so <laughs> disturbing, the amount of gun violence in these parts of the city. It's really disturbing. Yeah. So Jacqueline Jakunski asked, what is your practice like under the pandemic? Are you still walking? How has it changed? So first of all, a big, big hug to you, Jacqueline. <laughs> I really miss you. Um, yeah, it, I still wonder. I mean, sometimes, of course, here in Berlin, uh, you have to actually wear a mask in some streets. I do that as well, of course. Huh? And it's a very interesting time because the city is now in Berlin, but other cities as well, uh, more empty. So I, in some ways I can see things much more clearly. And there are certain changes happening all over the world. And it's very interesting, I think, historically to try and um, take, make images of these changes. One big change, uh, the number of people who throw away their masks onto the ground, <laughs> crazy. And also um, how our body languages have somehow changed. Huh? Is much more concentration on, on, on eye contact now, and um, over, over and above the masks, trying to see who, who what's happening behind the mask. Huh? And then um, social distancing, and some people are really afraid. Huh? And, you know, at one time people were wearing gloves, you know, these plastic gloves. That's stopped now, more or less. Yeah, so Jacqueline, huh? nice to hear from you, and I hope we can meet up again very soon. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone asked, an honest attendee asked, what cameras do you use or prefer? So I didn't quite get the question. What cameras you use or prefer? Um, they are what are called twin lens reflexes. It's like the Rolli Flex. That's my favorite camera actually. And I use them, I've been using them since um, 1990. Yeah? So that's about 30 years. Wow, long time. So um, yeah, I really like the camera very much. It suits very much my way of working and also my hands. And I really want to stress this. The camera is more or less like, just like an instrument. Huh? And to be good at it, to, at taking photographs, to lit you literally have to use it every day. Huh? You don't necessarily have to go out and wander like I do. I mean, there are so many different ways of taking, making photographs. You can work in the studio. You can take a photograph once every 10 years or five years or five hours or five minutes, whatever it is. But the most important is to do the work. I think it's very, very important. This is another image again with the fencing, very, very much in the front. But also this was a figure of um, Jesus Christ, but uh, in black, huh? so mm -hmm. black face. Huh? Found it very, very interesting. Another image which I worked at a quite a long time, huh? Mm -hmm. trying to find the right position, position, positionality, as they say. And then shortly thereafter, this is quite a, um, uh, the side street in um, um, North Londale. The police came, <laughs> but they were not, not looking for me. They were looking for somebody else. Huh? And uh, one of them came um, in civil, in, in civilian clothes. But somehow he sussed out what I was doing and was polite to me, huh? and, uh, a white policeman. Huh? And I, um, it's... Again, the way you carry yourself, I, I didn't feel challenged or in danger or that he would come and sort of try. No, it's, so it, it's very much, the, I think, very important the way you carry oneself as well. Very, very important. This image leads nicely to a question we got from Mohammed Salah. How do you approach the topic of spirituality through work and what is your take on time and space? It's a big question, but the spirituality part I was curious about too. I've heard you talk about it before. <laughs> So Mohammed Salah, it's a very, very in-depth question. Um, we move through time in space. That's a very, very short answer. We will talk more about it, Mohammed. Huh? And then spirituality for me is very important in, in the aspect that um, my take is that we are all actually spirits. Um, embedded within our, our, our bodies, our physical cloaks, looking or uh, striving for maturity. This is very, very important. Many of us don't realize this, don't know that we have actually a kind of inner spirit kern, um, how can you call it, a spirit um, within us. Huh? And then of course, we, we think it's just one life. I, I'm very much of the uh, knowledge of reincarnation. We keep on coming till we reach a certain maturity where we no longer have to come. 
that doesn't mean you go straight to paradise. Huh? <laughs> paradise is still a long, long way. Huh? And it's very much, again, um, trying to understand all these threads, huh? be it in whatever um, particular socialization, relig religiosity you've grown up in, huh? be it um, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, all kinds, there are so many different ways. Huh? For me, it's very, very important to try to understand the particular spirituality of a particular area. So for example, in West Africa, before Christianity, before, before Islam, we had our own religions. And these are, are still very, very strong currents in, in today's um, West Africa. This was a fascinating image for me because um, I did a, a boat trip, architectural boat trip or in Chicago. And um, it was very, very good. It took about an hour and a half. And the um, guide in, in the, and on the trip explained to us that high rises start with this triangle. They hold up the high rise, so fascinating. And then it, it's sort of, you, the more you learn, the more you see, the more you understand, the more you realize you still have so much more to learn. You hardly know anything, so fascinating. That's great. We only have a few more minutes, but I wanted to get to, I think this image that we used or they used in the advertisement <laughs> for this program. Um, someone had a question specifically about it. Elizabeth Bukta um, wants to know if you could speak a little bit about this um, poster that was designed by Charles Dawson and why you made this photograph. And that's our last question I think we have time for. Um, for me, it's, it's perhaps, um, bringing the whole problematic of, um, yeah, first of all, of Chicago, of the history of Chicago, but then also of all the different peoples in Chicago, in the United States, here on earth, it, uh, also in the, in, um, in the, in the bigger the global space, trying to find their ways together so now this apparently was, um, is the, um, what do you call it, the etiquette for a particular um, cream. And for me, it's so fascinating. It's a vanishing cream. So if you rub the cream on your body, you actually vanish and you come out something else. Huh? You have a brighter skin or, you know, as I also said, lucky brown. Huh? Apparently this um, company was were owned by white people, but they were making products for brown people or black people. I found it so um, um, very fascinating. I must say a word of thanks to the, um, the historian in whose office I took this image, uh, was Tim Samuelson, who I just recently learned has retired now, but such a wonderful man. And it's these wonderful moments, I want to really stress this, which made my stay in Chicago so really beautiful. I met wonderful people, all the team from the um, Chicago Architectural Biennial, Jacqueline as well, but also Tim Samuels, so many other people too. It's really beautiful. And it's in these moments, and they go as from day to day, moment to moment, it just makes a, actually a wonderful passage. And then of course, I mean, there were some, um, how can I put it, um, on, on happy moments, not for me personally, but one day I was on the subway and somebody was talking about going to hospital because he had been shot in the leg. So he was going to see how the, um, the wound was healing and so on. So then you realize <laughs> it's, not, it's not all um, honky-dory as they say, huh? but yeah, we all move forward. Huh? So thank you very much, um, Gerstin. It's been a beautiful conversation. Huh? Thank you so much. It's an honor to speak with you and, and I hope that our paths cross again soon. And thank you all for coming today. I believe they'll I see, record this and post it to the website. <laughs> thank you very much too as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. I don't know how to eat.